Welcome to the Jury Thinks What podcast. Part of the Lawyer Minds ecosystem, the Jury Thinks What podcast discusses everything there is to know about trying cases, from preparing the case before the lawsuit is filed all the way to trial, and most importantly, how to understand what the jury is thinking. During our journey, we'll be talking to some of the brightest trial lawyers from many walks of life. What makes them successful? What makes them different? Do they have secrets to dealing with the jury? Let's find out. Here's your host of the Jury Thinks What podcast, Saul Gruber. And thank you, everyone, for joining the Jury Thinks What. This is a podcast by trial lawyers for trial lawyers. And I am Saul, your host, Saul Gruber from Gruber Trial Consulting. We are on the Lawyer Mind Network, and you can find us anywhere you get your normal podcasts. Again, as I say every time, the purpose of this podcast is to help lawyers who are both very experienced and inexperienced with different things in litigation and at trial. If you have a question or you want to uh, hear more about a topic, please feel free to email me at saul at grubertrialconsulting.com. Also, uh, we have uh, videos that go out every Wednesday on trial tips and things about nursing home cases. So feel free to go to the Saul Gruber YouTube channel and subscribe. You will then get alerted about all of our uh, new uh, videos and a lot of them have really good tips uh, based on questions that come up during these podcasts and questions that just come up in general litigation. So uh, I think you'll find them very helpful. And again, uh, I am Saul Gruber and this is The Jury Thinks What? a podcast by trial lawyers for trial lawyers. And today I'm excited to have both Michael Bonamart and Steve Levin, two uh, Chicago lawyers from Levin and Percante, who uh, Steve is one of the pioneers of nursing home litigation all over the country. And both Steve and Mike have uh, many, many seven figure verdicts and teach all over the country about uh, different topics that are really helpful to everyone. And I think you're really gonna enjoy today's podcast. And again, we're back. This is The Jury Thinks What? And this is Saul Gruber from Gruber Trial Consulting. And I have two incredible lawyers uh, who I've known for an awfully long time uh, with us. We have Mike Bonamart and Steve Levin from Levin and Percante, two Chicago lawyers who are the best of the best in handling nursing home cases all over the country. Um, their, their verdicts speak for themselves. They're eight-figure verdicts up and down, seven-figure verdicts up and down. And it's just incredibly impressive. And those of us who, who think of ourselves as pretty good nursing home lawyers normally go out of our way to listen to both of them when they're speaking because they're that good. Welcome, Steve and Mike. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Saul. Thanks for the kind introduction. <laughs> so I know I've talked to you guys both a little bit about your perceptions of settlement and mediation and, and how you want to do things a little bit different than a lot of us traditionally do that. So I'd love for you guys to start telling us about that. Well, I, I could sort of capture our approach by a, a, a little story. And years ago, there was a fellow associated with uh, what was then called ATLA, a guy named Richard Halpern. I think he was a member of ATLA. I'm not sure if he was a lawyer, but he was active in the insurance annuity world. And from New Jersey. Right. And he said something to me, not to me individually, but he wrote something that I read that I have, uh, I, I've never forgotten. And what he said was, when you're negotiating a case, don't think that you're asking for money, but that you're selling a release. And that is a concept that we try to incorporate in all of our negotiations. Selling a release, meaning I have something of incredible value to you, Mr. Defendant, and if you give me a fair and reasonable offer, I will sell it. If not, I will go to trial. Now, I'm not suggesting that that advice always be followed literally, but I'll tell a little story about Mike. So Mike went to negotiate a case with a judge we frequently appeared before, and after the negotiation ended in a, not a settlement, the judge called me and said, who is this guy Bonamarte and what is he talking about? He's talking about selling releases? I've never heard anything like that. 
who says selling releases? I said, well, maybe he interpreted uh, some of our uh, positions on this a little too literally. <laughs> but that is the concept. And by that, I mean the whole negotiation process is structurally unfair to the people on our side. And by that, I mean there's a perception that we're asking somebody for money that they don't want to pay. And we typically, our clients are involved in this in a one shot deal. So once money starts being offered, our clients start thinking about what it is they might be losing if they don't accept the offer. That from the beginning puts them in a difficult position and an understandable position because they are a one-time participant in the, in the process. Think about our people on the other side. The people on the other side have hundreds of cases. Really, they're just distributing the aggregate of whatever insurance policies they have to try to save some money. They don't care what happens in individual cases, and it doesn't stress them out not to pay money. They can just move on to the next case. And how the process works, and I see it so clearly after years and years of doing this, is just take a hypothetical claims period where there's $10 million in coverage. So what our opponents do, the insurance companies and the nursing home changes and uh, chains and the hospitals is, they first knock out the low hanging fruit. They request mediations and they take the cases and settle them for far less than they were from the clients who just want the money or from the attorneys who are selling cases in bulk as opposed to looking at individual cases. So then they knock off the low hanging fruit and they start another process and get to the next level. And it's only till they get to that tier of attorneys that they believe will try the case and we'll try it competently, but I'm telling you, we'll try the case is, is the crucial. Right. Try it competently is a, is, a, is a bonus. And that gives you, and that's what you get as a result of your uh, uh, reputation. That's when they start talking serious money. That's why firms like ours who try these cases, and they know we will try any case, uh, get two to three times the settlement values. And people have actually in, involved us in the process just to handle this part of the case. And it's based on, obviously it's our preparation and our knowledge of putting the case together, but it's based on a, 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 a rep reputation we earned the hard way that we're just hard nosed sons of bitches. You know, it's we funny. don't care about your insurance coverage, right. that's your problem. We don't care about your limitations. We don't, we're, you know, we're, we're way past listening to older people's lives, don't have value in nursing home cases. And if you want to try the case, we'll try the case. And that terrifies them. I have, I, I, I'm on a, uh, I deal with a lot of younger lawyers and I guess a lot of them are reading books about settlement demands and trying to settle cases. And I get this question all the time, you know, what can I do to, to get the bigger settlement? And I hear all these other answers. Well, you read certain books by trial guides and this, and, and my answer is try 10 cases. And, and you'll watch, regardless of what the verdicts are, you try 10 cases or even five to 10 cases, and you watch the offers dramatically increase because now you're in a different level than everybody else is. Here, here's, I'm gonna just add one thing, then I'll, and I'm sure, I know Mike has a lot to say, but. This is a little bit of a controversial thought that I'm gonna put out there. But I think young lawyers or lawyers inexperienced in handling whatever type of case they decide to handle, like a nursing home case, need to think about the client. So when I see things on the listserv to the effect that I've never tried a nursing home case before, could you send me your complaint, your interrogatories, your experts, and anything else you know about the case? so I can learn the case. I don't think, and I feel sort of strongly on this, and I know I'm gonna annoy some people, that that is putting the interests of your client first. The analogy I would give is, let's assume you're working on a medical malpractice case, and somehow you gained access to a doctor's listserv, and you found out the doctor who performed the heart surgery on your patient wrote a letter to the listserv 
of other doctors saying, you know, I haven't done one of these heart surgeries in a long time. I don't know if I've ever done one. Could you give me some guidelines or some tips because I have this patient and he needs heart surgery? Do you think that would be something you could use in your case? So I'm not discouraging people from asking for help, but there's a way to get help and help the client at the same time. And that is associate with lawyers who know what they're doing and learn from them. It won't cost you any money. It won't affect your relationship with the client, but it'll get, put you in a position where you can gain the knowledge to represent people confidently. And that's what the clients deserve. And no one really talks to this issue, but I, maybe it's a function of my age and more I, I see this, that it's just not fair to the client. It, it's funny you say that. First, I would tell you, you can't worry about annoying people. I mean, you both have known me for a long time. I have a certain effect on some people. I'm past it. If they're annoyed, they're annoyed. And secondly, you're absolutely right. I mean, I can remember the first nursing home case we handled, I think it was 94, and I associated Ruben, Chris Dolan. Um, so I could start to figure out, you know, I read his book and I wanted to figure out, well, how do you do these things? And, and the second one, I think I associated Dave Hoey and we kind of were having fun together doing it. And then, I, then I got to the point where I thought, okay, I could do this. Uh, once we, we started to handle the cases with people that do it on a regular basis, I don't know why people don't do that more often. I think, I think it should be done a hundred percent of the time. But remember, Steve, when you and I were younger, um, and Mike, you've worked at Steve's office almost your whole career, right? Whole career. Yeah. So we, I worked at a firm. So when I wasn't quite sure what I was doing, I had the main litigator that I could ask, hey, how do you do this at a deposition? How do you do that? What I find now is a lot of people are just opening up their own firms as solos right out of law school, and they lose that mentor completely. And that, that becomes dangerous, I think. Well, now I also have the advantage in settlements of being able to say, I don't care what you do, but if you don't settle it, I'll sick Mike on you. And that was, it is inspiring a little fear in our opponents. So, so Mike, let's go back. So you, you go to the judge and you're trying, to, you're trying to sell a release and that doesn't work. Um, obviously you come back and you say, okay, I have to do this a little bit differently. Tell us about that. Well, you know, in that, in that situation, I, I, that was probably 10 to 12, 13 years ago. So I was kind of learning a little bit about how the process worked. Eventually that case got resolved, but for, for sure, the biggest impact on me in terms of success at mediation has come in the last six or seven years. And it's as a result of having tried about 10 cases in the last five, six years or so. And that's everything from you know, nursing home cases, an ankle fracture to a failure to diagnose lung cancer in a medical malpractice case. And not only is it, am I sure that other people are aware of it, because word travels fast and Steve spreads that word also, as he just mentioned, but it also gives me a little bit different attitude and more confidence going into it. And it's not cocky, it's not a cocky attitude, but perhaps a little bit more nonchalance. Like, you know, here's your opportunity. If you pay it, I, if, you, if you don't pay it, I understand. We just have a different view about the value of the case, but this is what's gonna happen if we don't get it resolved after today. And once as a young lawyer or, or perhaps somebody like myself, who's maybe not a young lawyer, but kind of in the, maybe the prime years of his legal career, when you've got that confidence. What's that, Steve? I don't know where that puts me if Mike is in the prime years. I, I assume I'm in the primer years. <laughs> Maybe you're in the prime of a different, uh, a, a different stage of your legal career, but in a different role. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, being the person that can go in there and say, yes, 
uh, I'll resolve the case today, but if not, having that confidence to turn the money down, it, it gives you a good sense of power, uh, I think. And it is, there's just no question it has increased the value of several cases over the last several years. So most of the people listening to this podcast probably don't have the verdicts one of you had, let alone both of you together, as well as the rest of the firm, which I, I know most of the people over there pretty well. Everybody's got big verdicts. I don't, I can't remember anybody working there and not having a big verdict, not reading Steve's note saying, I want to congratulate Margaret or this person for this $8 million verdict. So you go in and you, you don't want to come off you don't want to put the insurance adjuster off or the defense attorney off. Mike, how do you start that process? Well, uh, I would say I, I react more than uh, let them, you know, decide kind of where they're going to take it and then react depending on how they go. Cause sometimes, you know, it could be surprisingly pleasant and it just goes smoothly and there's not a lot of confrontation a lot of that may depend on the mediator that you choose. Uh, and I think that's an important part of the, the decision. But even when, you know, you have the mediator or the judge that has the, the reputation or they're beating up on you or they're saying things that you don't necessarily want to hear, it, it's the way I would go about it. And I've certainly been guilty of not following this in the past is, you know, you can get frustrated by it. And you just, you got to try to, to stop that and just, just take a nice, calm approach to the whole thing. And I think that kind of helps with the process. And by doing that, I think it causes for probably more anxiety for the other side. The more calm and, and less worked up that the plaintiff's lawyer is getting in one room, the more anxious the defense lawyer and adjuster are getting in the other. I mean, I think I 100% agree with Mike, and I think it's it's something like this. Well, I hear, I hear what you're saying, Mr. Mediator. I hear what they're saying. Here's what we're saying. I think we have the better side of that. Who knows who's going to, it would only be a jury to tell us who's right, but it's not about who's right or wrong. It's do they view any risk to them based on the position we're taking? Because if they're right, they win. Or, they lower a verdict. If they're wrong, are they willing to uh, accept the consequences? When you do get worked up, your client gets worked up. And how many of us are seen where the client says, I'm just tired of the whole process. Right. I want to settle the case. Silently, the plaintiff's lawyer may be saying the same thing. But in response to your specific question, if you don't have the verdicts, uh, and you don't have the experience, what do you do? Well, first of all, you need to truly understand the case and you need to be able to sort out the BS defenses that they say in every case and the real defenses that they might have in your case. So that gets into what we've always talked about, which is identifying the defenses and disarming them. But you right. have to know them in advance. When they say your client is old, when they say your client has medical conditions, when they say your client doesn't have a wage loss or a job, that's true of every nursing home case. Every single one. Yeah. Or when they say, well, uh, doc, just because it wasn't documented, it didn't mean we didn't write it down. That's fine, except if their witnesses said they didn't write it down. So they, there's probably 10 or 15 standard defenses that I could be the subject of another talk right. that oftentimes the discovery you took has eliminated or should have. So I would say to the meter, that's a good defense, but that's actually not what they said here. So that's why the depositions are so important, or at least some of them, to disarm those defenses. But so so but so let's assume you've done the preparation, but you don't have the trial experience and you want to mediate the case. Well, the defense has got to believe that you have the proper funding to take the case to a conclusion. If they suspect you don't have the resources for whatever reason, shortness of money, not enough money on the case, or whatever your reason is, that is going to result in a lesser settlement, period. So you have to say, 
something to the effect, you know, I know you guys know I haven't tried one of these cases. I mean, front the issue, but I'm going to try this one. And I think I'm going to win this one. And, and, and I'm here to try to reasonably sell it. But I'm, my client should not have to take a discount. I mean, I have a, 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 a saying for everything, but one would be. I know you do. In this situation, my client should not have to take a discount because you think I'm not as experienced as Steve Levin. Okay, we're not going to do that, you said. Right. I mean, that you, it's bluster. I mean, you don't have the results, so you, you have to bluster, but not in an angry way, just a matter-of-fact way. They have, when they're done, they have to believe in your soul. You are prepared to and are going to try the case. And you could, you know, you, you got to try to reverse engineer it. And, you know, it'll be fun trying the case against this defense lawyer because I have nothing to lose, nor does my client. My client wants to try it. I want to try it. He's won some cases, but... And, and I think that the selling of the trial is the most important, one of the most important things we do at mediation is to say, look, we'd love to settle the case, but we've prepped this for trial from the moment it came into the door. Right. You know, and, and I think you always have to do that as a plaintiff lawyer. And you always have to sell that to the defense. And it's easier if you're, you guys, and, and I guess me to a certain extent when I was still practicing in New Jersey, I mean, they knew I, I would try the case over anything, but that was fine. Let's just do it. I mean, that's what we do for a living. And, and I think it made a large difference when we were negotiating. But so, so for someone who doesn't have the verdicts, you really have to s sell the fact that you're going to try the case and you're looking forward to trying the case. And, and, and getting angry is a waste of time. Oh, they've only offered $10,000. Right. Waste of time. Let the, I mean, if you want, you, you should try to fairly let the process work and let the mediator, if it's a good one, try to do what the mediator is trying to do without compromising your position. And if it doesn't sell, it doesn't settle. Remember this, I sometimes like to leave them. If I know the case is gonna settle, isn't going to settle, I feel good if I know they haven't offered all the money they had to offer. Right. Because then you put them in a position where they don't know what to do. They don't know if they did offer all the money they had, you would take it. And so they're afraid now of being criticized. Well, you had three, why did you only offer one? And now we got a million dollar verdict, maybe three would have done it. So right. the whole idea is to, in a nice, in a passive aggressive way is put the, put the anxiety on the other side. Now, now other just simple tips I would give people. Past jury verdicts are in no way predictive of whatever case you have. Past settlements, by definition, aren't predictive right. because those are just two lawyers agreeing on a price for something. I mean, I guess if there was a series of 100 soft tissue cases involving the identical injury in the identical jurisdiction, it may be predictive. But in our types of case, each fact pattern, and I know you talk about this all, and, and, and you know, there's not, not a typical case. It's not a bed sore case. Right. But our cases have such an infinite variety of fact patterns from the lawyers involved, from the judge involved, from your clients involved, from the defendants, that is eventually going to be decided by 12 people no one has met, and the, the variables that could come into the, that, it's just not predictive. And you just say, you know, if you're going to base it on a jury verdict that, you know, I was in a medical malpractice they were talking about, some jury verdict that happened six years ago, on, on, I said, okay, wh what does that tell me? I, I don't know anything about that case. So, so that's, that's number one. But understand settlements are based on just what lawyers agree to. And it's a self-perpetuating myth because if I settle a case based on what someone else settled the case on, the, they're gonna see my result. Then the next person, now he said, look, this is what these cases settle for. And it's it's, it's a real problem, I think. It, it, it's, it is a problem. You just have to ignore it. Because I, insurance companies base their decisions on, they like to have tangible factors. Right. What happened in the past? How many years left in the life? What are the medical bills? What's the wage loss? Numbers. They like numbers and they like to settle it based on those numbers. But I think what we've all learned in recent times is, those numbers and that, that has no meaning. You know, we, it wasn't until very recently that we stopped putting specials into evidence. Well, 
millions of cases have settled as a multiple of specials. Now people say, you don't, correctly so, that you shouldn't even put them in if you're looking for millions of dollars right. as an anchor. So all that stuff, I mean, you have to be respectful and pretend to hear what they're saying, but all that stuff is just words designed to try to settle whatever case you have within the same range, 10 other cases in the past settled. And, and that just is not what, what, what you have to convince them about is, look, this is a unique sort of Nick Rowley type stuff, a unique right. human injury. No one knows how to value these. I mean, like people say, well, the wrongful, he was going to live three years versus five years. That, that means the case where the life expectancy is three years is worth less. I mean, honestly, how would any juror know that? It's not what they're going to base it on. Right. I mean, I've always, I've always tried to figure out what the, especially when early on in my career, what the real difference between a $10,000 case and a 12, five case was, I, I would always try to say, well, there's no difference. There's not a difference in the world in those two cases. And really, what's the difference between a $200,000 case and a $300,000 case? The, who's on the case? What we feel like when we woke up in the morning? Let me ask you this, Mike, going based on what, what Steve just said. My last point is, the, uh, the, so the way you translate this into action, if right. you're crazy, you say, I can't see an upside exposure. I can't see anything that's going to limit the verdict on the upside. That's why I want to try this case. I understand that either the, there's the insurance companies paid or the insured's going to pay. And if they're claiming a lack of insurance coverage, then the insured has to think more. I believe we're going to win this case. I am going to ask for X. And whatever happens, happens. That's my theory. I, I can't predict the future. Uh, judges, people, that, if anyone should know what a case is worth, we should. I don't know. Right. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. But I want to follow up with Mike on that because um, when you, when, if I get what you and Steve are saying is you want, you want to take the power seat at the mediation, right? Rather than us begging the defense for money, our thought process is the defense is begging us for a release. Um, now, when they start in with the defenses, how do, and, and they're, they're going to talk about life expectancy and things of that nature. Mike, what are you doing to show what risk they have and why it's worth more? So obviously I'm prepared to talk about each of the defenses and in, in that regard there's some similarities to how we think about mediations before they happen and how we think about depositions. And I suspect that a lot of lawyers when they go into mediations they're thinking okay I've demanded this, they've offered this or they've offered nothing, I'd like to get here, but they haven't really gone beyond that and thought about how they're going to handle what the mediator says, how they're going to handle uh, the mediator, you know, beating up on them about there's no verdicts of this, anywhere close to what you're looking for in this county. How are you going to handle when the defense feeds the mediators some of the defense, the actual substantive defenses in the case? Are you prepared to talk about those? So it's 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 got to be a lot more in depth thinking than I'm sure or suspect that a lot of lawyers are doing. They've got, they've kind of got an idea where they like to end up, but they haven't really strategized and talked to people and bounced it off other people about how they're going to get there. So, you know, to, to address one of Steve's points, he's obviously is right. I mean, no one knows the value of the case, but I would say that past Verdicts in some respects are relevant if you're the attorney that's gotten them. In other words, they know that, okay, maybe there's not an exact verdict for a pressure sore for an 87 year old with the same medical conditions your client has, but they know you're the type of lawyer that doesn't really care and is not afraid to ask for a big number. In other words, are you doing what you can to make yourself such that you're not the low hanging fruit Right. In this discussion. So, I mean, that's kind of how I would go about it. The, the, the angriest I get at a mediation is, is pretty calm, just saying to the judge, you know, if they're really low, if I even want to say this, they're just, it's, they're just kind of making it easy for us here, judge. And that's right. what I think Steve was talking about when he's saying, 
you know, they've, they've, they've only offered 100, but maybe they have three or four and it would actually settle the case. By putting that anxiety back on them, then you, you may increase the offer if that's what you want to do, like maybe they're, they're actually close. But a lot of it is just thinking about all these things in advance the same way you would think about a deposition and the points you want to make and how you're going to disarm the defenses. And, and so, so you guys are really thing. strategizing for the mediation as you would strategize for a deposition or even a trial before the mediation. Yeah. Yes. You could argue that it's even more important to do that because you probably resolve more cases by mediation than you do by trial. We well, I've noticed now everything is mediated. Um, I don't, I don't have an answer for anything they will say during the mediation. And we're very strict about determining when we're going to participate in the mediation process. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, if a defense lawyer calls us up and says, my client wants to mediate, I'll say, well, why? He says, well, they, they just want to mediate because they know it's the, 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 the knocking out the low hanging fruit process. I don't know why they think that about us still today, but they don't care about individual cases. They have a macro approach. But I said, well, have they evaluated the case? Well, I think they have. Well, have they talked to you about it? No. Well, do you have any idea what their position on the case is? No. Well, have they heard our demand? No, the yes. I don't, I, I think so. Well, have they told you what area they're in? No, they don't talk to me. I said, well, honestly, you're not giving me enough information to decide if I wanna participate in the mediation or not. Now, some lawyers say, well, I want them to put money on. Right. That's a double-edged sword. I mean, if you're, I'll just make up numbers, demanding a million and they put 50,000 on it and you agree to participate, that's a tacit concession that you're looking for something. So I'm very, very careful about mediating cases. I, I need to know the defense lawyer. I need to know that they're serious. I need to know that they're in communication with their client, or I need to know their who their client is. And I make all these decisions, we do as a firm, and Mike does the same thing before we even participate in mediations. Let me give you, a, tell me if I'm talking too much, so, but let me give you a classic situation that just happened today. And anyone who does nursing home cases, I'm sure has been in this situation. A defense lawyer called me up and said, uh, you have uh, five cases uh, within this aggregate limitation and there's only, I'll make up the number, um, $1.4 million that can be attributable to all cases. And do you want to have a mediation? My insurance company is going to be there. My client's going to be there. And I said, well, it's not that I'm opposed to resolving the case, but I, I, I just want to know how it's worked. Are you saying that, you know, the whole one, I said, I'm not going to mass my clients. I'm going to need individual offers and individual discussions. For the sake of discussion, though, what is the total amount you have attributable to settling these five cases that you're calling me about? Well, I'm not sure what that number is. I said, well, it might be a good idea to find that out. Uh, before we even have the mediation. I don't care what it is, but it's important to me if that's your upper cap. Right. Then I say to them, and you know, this is not a standard mediation. Another, just as an example of one type of preparation, one type of situation. So I say to them, well, uh, this is not a standard negotiation. You're not asking me to sit down and resolve the fair value of the case. You're asking me for mercy. You're asking my clients to except a discount. Well, typically before I will give someone a discount, they have to show me what they have available. Well, I'm not sure if my client's going to want to do that. They don't have to, and I don't care, but, but that's just something I need to know. So we, we actually got this tiered into three things. First, they're going to give me the amount they claim. I was suspect when the insurance defense lawyer calls the client, it'll go south, but he wants to give me the amount they've reserved for each case. What they're claiming is the aggregate level. And then I said, if I hear all those numbers, maybe we'll go to the next step, but I'll probably want to know at that time whether right. or not the client is willing to chip in some of his money. And I understand, by the way, I say to the guy, if they don't, they don't. But, you know, 
I actually used a quote from uh, Dusty Baker that I read in the paper today, who, as you know, is the manager of the Houston Astros. And he uh, was out on the mound talking to the pitcher, and he was going to leave him in. Because he said to the pitcher something like, you've gotten out of this jam before. The pitcher was a little bit whiny. He said, well, why don't you just put your big boy pants on, <laughs> strike the next guy out, and we'll be done. So I actually used it. I said to the defensive player, client, he's got to put his big boy pants on. This problem is not going away. We right. never give up. We will be here forever. And he could either deal with it now or later. Make a decision. Do you ever? Another uh, example just of things to think about in advance or conditions to put on the mediation in, in advance is a multiple defendant case. Because I'm sure a lot of people have gone to mediations and that there's low offer after low offer, and then you're talking to the judge, and the reason that there's they're at that point is because the two defendants can't agree with each other about who's more responsible. Right. So we had some conditions where we're either going to talk to both sides extensively in advance of agreeing to any mediations, or recently, and some of the mediators have loved this idea, we've suggested that they have a mediation with the defendants before we participate. And the mediator meets with the, the multiple defendants and, and then they can get some idea whether or not it's going anywhere and whether or not the defendants are on the same page as to who's paying what share and things like that. Do you ever mediate before you begin discovery? Yes. And, and, and based on what you guys were just saying regarding being able to disarm the defenses, what type of facts would make you want to mediate before discovery starts as opposed to waiting to get some depositions? Well, in? I would just make, depending on the facts of a medical malpractice, just look, if you guys are going to dispute that it's a misread x-ray at the mediation, we're not mediating. Or you tell Got me it. what food is and I'll continue it. Or if you're going to dispute this, you know, it's, it's pointless to mediate. So we're going to assume we're mediating on the basis of this, this, and this, or tell me how you dispute it. I mean, they could have a legitimate dispute, but it would have to make sense. It wouldn't be one of those defenses they come up with at the beginning that turn out to be ridiculous in whatever case you're dealing with. So that's the condition. Uh, we assume the best of our case. Now, if we're a little bit worried about our case, or we know something that they right. may know, then you know it's a case by case strategy. But just just one last thing that reminded me when Mike was talking, when I was talking to the defense lawyer today, because he said, Well, we'll pay for the mediation. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, when they offer to pay for the mediation, either before the mediation or during the mediation, they're screwing you. Right. They're picking up the check after a big win. Let's just say that. <laughs> a big win, I want a lot of money for you, fine, I'll pick up the check. That's what they're doing. So that's a big clue. But it, it makes the situation worse when he was doing it in a wasting policy. I said, forget my feelings about when you say you're picking up the <laughs> mediation. You're picking it up with my money, with my client's money. Well, I... I how sincere could someone be or how well thought out could their position be when they would even, he said, you know, most plaintiff's lawyers don't raise that point. I wondered why. <laughs> I couldn't answer that question, but you just got to listen to their words and apply logic. A lot of people approach it with anger. Same thing with depth. Someone says something you don't, you don't like, you start arguing with the person. You go nowhere. Something, somebody says something you don't like and you start reasoning it out with them in a way that will eventually undermine their position, it's a whole different thing. Same approach to mediation. Listen to what they're really saying in context of, of reality, not the wish that they give you money. It's not a wish thing, like Mike said. I mean, sometimes in, when I used to, in the old, old, old days when I used to do auto cases, the adjuster would say, I'm, I think I'm going to pay you 15, 15 or 20,000 on this case. Oh, okay, I'll take the 15. Okay, if the plaintiff lawyers say, I'm going to sell this case for 200 or 100. Oh, what do you right. think I'm going to sell it for? 15. 
95, right. <laughs> All right, that's, uh, that's, uh, I'll stop pontificating on this, but it, it's, it, this is a true, real money thing. You get more money doing what I'm suggesting for your client. You get what I would call to be fair value. One of the things that I always did, and looking back on it, I'm sorry I did it, is, is every year we would value cases. And we would say, okay, here's 120 nursing home cases. And here's what I think the low value is. Here's what I think the high value is. Here's what I think the cost will be if we litigate it to try to get a handle on cash flow. And invariably, we would always resolve those cases that don't go to trial somewhere between that low and that high. And it's not till later that I realized, of course we did. We, we set, even though we didn't tell anybody, we set the value of the case before we knew anything about the case rather than let the case go and, and really extend the value. It was like the self-fulfilling prophecy. And I, and I think that's what I see out there an awful lot. That's what every insurance company does. They just do it at a lower level on every case all the time. Right. And I think for us, we've got to get out of that habit as plaintiff lawyers and start getting into the habit of, well, what's the story and why isn't this the case that's the biggest case? Right. I agree with you on that. So that's what we try to do. So we're, we're trying to get the story. I, I tell people, go out, meet with the client, go out to their home, talk to them, just find out who they are and try not even to take notes sometimes. But when you're going into that mediation, Mike, and, and you want to get across the story of the client. How do you do that? Uh, I try to, to really you know, think about that and what we're giving to the mediator. Uh, I'm not afraid to share more. I think I used to, I'd be, you know, do I really want to put all this in the mediation submission? And now I, I've become a lot more open because you know, it comes back to we're the ones that select our cases, right? So you, you got to do some, you have to do the things that you're talking about. And, and what's, I think, difficult, especially if you have a lot of nursing home cases, is you got to somehow relate to your client and be able to, to talk about, know a little bit about them, know a little bit about the residents. I mean, if you get you know, sometimes people will talk to some of the lawyers, even in our firm, the younger lawyers, and, and I say, they'll tell me about the pressure story. I say, well, tell me a little bit about the guy. What was what was his story? Then it comes out, oh, he was a, a World War II veteran. I mean, imagine where you could take that in terms of somebody that was very proud. He lived a very proud life, and now he's resorted for the first time to rel relying on other people for help, and, and what did they do? They destroyed his dignity. So you, you got to get some of that background information, and in because the, the, the contemporaneous medical records, that's all easy. You need to know that to, def to to prosecute the case, to refute the defenses, but you have to do what you're suggesting, and, and really get to know a little bit about the background of who you're representing, who the family is. Right. And and I think that resonates well with with the mediators and that's something that's easy to convey you know this this these, this family is going to be fantastic on the stand if you if you try if they try this case do you ever do uh, an interview of the family members uh, that isn't necessarily oh. a deposition but just talk to them i mean and, and put it on tape and, and show that to the mediator yes you know I, I, i'm not it on tape myself maybe we have i think in the in the past but interviewing the family members is part of the intake and then going a little bit deeper leslie uh, clement said something recently that i thought was pretty good she said you know she has them create a journal at the beginning of the case at the direction of her where they're Number one, just to preserve their memory because it's fresher probably when they're talking. And I, I like to try to get anecdotal stories from my clients. Right. Because it's one thing to say I love my mom, but, you know, I'll, I tell a personal story about my dad. He passed away when I was 50. And I'll tell my clients a little story about something that I remember as a kid. And... You know, a lot of times I'm reduced to tears while I'm telling them the story, and then they're reduced to tears, but they get, okay, that's what you mean by how, 
how do I express the, the depth of the relationship I had with my loved one? That's the stuff that I think resonates with juries. And I do it obviously a ton before trial. I say, give me, you know, give me 20 stories. Wow. And then, 20. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll sift through them and I'll kind of think of which ones I think I want you to talk about, but give, be over inclusive and, you know, I'm getting ideas right now. It's amazing the collegial process, but I think doing this before the, the mediation is something that could be beneficial because I agree with you. Because I, I see a lot of lawyers say they don't even prep their client for the mediation because their client's not going to say anything most likely. And I've often responded, well, you're not prepping the client. You're prepping yourself by talking to the client. I mean, you're, you're the mouthpiece for the client. Um, the well, way one way I would prep the client is prepare them for the nastiness of the, the process, how it's going to wear on them. They're going to get, despite everything I'm saying to you right now, client, you're going to get annoyed. You just want to get, you'll want to give in and you're going to have to resist that urge and trust us and listen to us and not getting, don't, the same thing we want to do as lawyers. We don't want to get angry with the initial right. offers and stuff like that because all that is meaningless, but it wears on the client because they're you know, the only non-professional that's involved in the process. Yeah, I, it's a very, I have really refined the way I try to explain that to clients. Uh, and it's just crucial. I tell them if it settles, great. If it doesn't, it absolutely affects nothing. I tell them that you're going to get upset no matter what you tell me right now because everybody gets upset. I tell them, you know, don't get upset if I'm pretending to be upset. I tell them the process is unpleasant, offensive, uh, manipulative. I, I, I basically, how do you say it, go, go against the whole purpose of the mediation. This is not about, let me make this point. This is not about getting to yes. You know, that old negotiation. Right. This is a zero sum game. And anything that I do is designed to get a maximum recovery for my client. And it's not, we have a joke in our office. I mean, you know, some people actually do like us, but we have a joke in our office that it's not about feelings. Oh, the adjuster is so shocked, Steve, that, that you did something. I said, first of all, adjusters don't have human emotions. And if they did, their bosses wouldn't let them use them. And second of all, it's not about feelings. I'm sorry, her feelings are hurt or his feelings are, oh, this guy said, Steve, you did. I'm, I'm not getting into that. We're gonna settle it on the case and their perception of risk. That's it. My perception of risk, their perception of risk. If you, everyone's willing to take the risk one way or the other, the case will be tracked. If not, it won't. Let's take feelings out of it. Well, Steve, we have a relationship with your firm. We settled them. So what are you asking me to do? Uh, sell out this client because we settled 10 in the past, or I'm not sure what that means. You're going to give me more than I should on the next case. I said, of course, I want to take a relationship, keep a relationship with you. That's why I'm totally transparent. That's why I do settle cases, but just because we disagree about value doesn't affect our relationship. I hope not. That, I hope it's not that thin. Uh, you make me laugh because I've had adjusters tell their defense lawyer saying, I just can't deal with him. He's, and, and, the adjust, and the lawyer will say, well, why do you say stuff? I'm like, I, I don't know what to tell you. They don't have to like me. I mean, this is the case. Uh, yet we have you know, two options. We could settle it or we could try it. There's, yeah. there's not a third option. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, guys. This was pretty enlightening. I want to end with one thing. If you had one tip to give a younger lawyer about uh, showing the uh, mediator what risks that the insurance company has and trying to pass that along, what would it be? Mike, let's start with you. I suppose it depends on what stage the lawyer's uh, career in, what stage they're in in their, his or her respective career. But my general tip to the younger lawyer, and, and I feel like even maybe I was it took me a, a little while to just kind of let go and try some cases. Obviously, once I did, I've had some success and, and I've tried a bunch, but I think 
if I had one, if I did one thing differently, I would have done some of the things I've done over the last seven, eight years, even as a second, third, fourth year lawyer, I would have let go a little bit more and perhaps gotten to the place I'm at now even sooner. Uh, I don't really have a ton of regrets. Things have worked out, but, but that's how ultimately you're going to have more success and confidence going into mediations. What about you, Steve? The one or two things that you would tell a young lawyer about how to show the uh, risk that the defense really has to up the value of the case? Take a reasonable position in the case based on, if you don't have your own expertise, consult with experts. Decide on what that number is that you think is fair and reasonable to resolve the case and believe it. Believe it and convince yourself that if they're not at that number, whatever it is, you have the resources and the willingness to try the case. I mean, I, I sort of remember in my own life like a transition where I, I, I would used to say these things when I was first starting out and I, I leave the mediation and want to throw up about the amount of money that I turned down. And, you know, and that's a process that goes on. So I don't know if it's just because I've seen it work so many times or because I actually believe it. I no longer have that anxiety. And whether you have it or not, my one tip is you can't show it. And that doesn't right. mean just screaming and yelling and being outraged. I think what you're trying to con con convey is a, even if the defense lawyer thinks it's misguided, a quiet, calm confidence that you're gonna try the case, period. Because I think everybody smells when, senses when we don't believe what we're saying. I mean, it, it's not hard. I know the jury does. You know, that's what yeah, all- I mean, Go ahead, Mike. I was just gonna say, I'm glad you said that and that Steve said that because it's the same thing applies when you're going to get up and ask for money in front of a jury. And, and can you look yourself, look at yourself in a mirror and say, all right, tomorrow I'm asking for 25 million. If you don't believe it yourself, then it's probably not going to come off real well in front of the jury. And I think the same principle applies that Steve just said when you're going into a mediation. Well, thank you both, Mike and Steve. If, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, how would they, how would they do that? Well, our firm main number is 312-332-2872. Uh, uh, obviously, go to our website, levinforcounty.com. You can always get a hold of me or Mike or anyone else in the firm, either by the main number our direct numbers or I'll put, nowadays I'm communicating mostly by my cell phone. So anyone can get me at 312-607-5504. And so I, I just, I saw, I just want to say to you, thank you for all you're doing. I mean, I think it's a real service to all of us that you're doing these focus groups to try to determine uh, how the crazy times we're living in are going to affect us. I suspect that's an ongoing effort because yeah. things happen, things will happen tomorrow that will change what everyone thought about what was going on two weeks ago. But well, I appreciate that effort. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you uh, both uh, Steve Levin and Mike Bonamart for some incredible suggestions on valuing your cases and mediating them. Uh, one of the most incredible tips I've heard in a long time is when mediating the cases, the theory or the feeling you should have is you're selling the defendant a release as opposed to begging them for money. Great stuff. And I think everybody who listens to it is going to have a lot of uh, takeaway from today's podcast. And in light of uh, the, uh, the nature of the podcast, uh, our nursing home minute today will be a little bit about valuing cases, and most importantly, liens. You have to remember that if you are a resident of a long-term care facility, it is almost impossible for you not to be receiving either Medicare or Medicaid or some type of substitute, whether it be from the military, the government, or a private substitute. Either way, there is going to be a lien. And the worst time to get a copy of the lien is when you get offers. 
You want to get it well before then so that you can incorporate it into everything you're doing and everybody knows exactly what the lien is. Um, it's rare in a nursing home case that, or even in a malpractice case, that you can't have the complete lien prior to filing a lawsuit. Obviously, automobile cases are a little bit different, but let's stick with nursing home. Get the lien before you file the complaint. Know what you're dealing with. Understand if it's Medicare, if it's Medicaid, exactly how it has to be repaid. That way it can be factored in before you begin to negotiate and your clients understand how much is going to be taken out of any settlement to repay uh, that amount. Please don't wait. Waiting eliminates real chances of you resolving the case. And this is Saul Gruber from Gruber Trial Consulting, your host of The Jury Thinks What? Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening and remind you to uh, go to YouTube and subscribe to Gruber Trial Consulting's YouTube uh, channel where a lot more information you can receive regarding um, trial tips, nursing home minutes, and various other things that affects litigation. And thanks for stopping by. We appreciate it. That concludes another episode of the Jury Thinks What podcast, part of the Lawyer Minds ecosystem. Thank you for listening, and we truly hope it was worth your time. Please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Explore the other content that Lawyer Minds has to offer and engage with us on social media. Your feedback and ideas are always welcomed. See you next time.